Scum Friends Season 6 tells the story of Lola. And we meet Lola a couple of days before her mother's funeral, just aimlessly wandering around the streets and listening for broken glass so that she can take a picture of the shattered remains. You know, it's a journal on her Instagram feed. Meanwhile, her older sister Daphne is trying to get a hold of her because Lola had been gone for a certain amount of time with no advice beforehand and wants to make sure that she isn't like dead in a ditch somewhere. She's not. If she is dead, it's in one way. And it's not in a ditch. It's on the inside. Lola ends up in a bar taking a photo of other broken things. And then she explains to a stranger that she likes taking pictures of flaws. And then fast forward to the funeral, Lola further gets into the thick of things like about her addictive personality and her mother's addictive personality. The fact that none of them are okay and that everything is a lie. <laughs> Basically, she is not managing her grief all that well. I mean, obviously. It's consuming her and it's making her act out. And thus begins the nosedive into the season about losing a parent, about having a problem with addiction, about falling in love with Maya, which we'll get to later, and much rather opening up to people online, and Elliot finally making his movie. So I'm going to go over this review in five major points, starting with Lola, who is herself and represents herself. I'm very smart, as you can see. Lola and Elliot, um, and I think Elliot here would represent her addictive side. Lola and Daphne, and I think Daphne here represents her heart and Lola and Maya, who represents an alternative way to grief, and Lola and Urbex, which kind of talks about alternate found families. High school shows are so hit or miss because they're either overly dramatic that you can't take it seriously, or they're just like overly comedic that you can't take it seriously. And it's right on that very fine line between the two, where that perfect balance lies. I think one of Scum's advantages in its format of telling stories from the perspective of the season lead is that it gives a lot of creative opportunity for jumping back and forth with themes and execution depending on the main character and how they view the world. So they can go from like comedic to dramatic to whatever is tonally appropriate for the lead. And I think that season three of Scum France, which is when I started tuning in, they've managed to create pretty unique setups to sort of ease you in as an audience member into who you're seeing the story through. Like with Luca and the choices for musical score, and then there's Arthur with the play on audio to immerse you into his disability. You know, with Lola, there isn't anything specifically new, but what made the story hers was just the writing of her character. I went back and forth with this on episodes one and two, but ultimately I think I fell in love with her somewhere in those events. Just as the season progressed, I found that there is a lot of depth to her and a lot of potential for more hard-hitting storyline. I think why I struggled to see her as a real person in the beginning, like in the first episode, was because of how everything she said and did kind of felt like a checklist of what WebMD would describe as a depressed person. And it was very textbook and kind of too on the nose, which kind of also brings me to another point of contention that I had early on in this season, which is that the show kind of has a tendency to spoon feed the audience, whether it's for the sake of clarifying something right away or to play on the drama. An example of the latter would be in episode one during the eulogies where Lola just straight up enumerates the conflicts of the season before it's even touched upon. And a major one being that she and Daphne have different fathers, that their mom is not this great saint and that their parents are imperfect and it's just because of their fuck-ups that she is the way that she is which turned out to be a major conflict in the show so instead of being able to explore that on your own and maybe finding something else in there to keep for yourself you're restricted to the themes already set for you and that's the thing about the execution that doesn't really sit right with me at times it's that it can be kind of suffocating and exposition heavy. All of that said, there were some shining moments in the season as well, especially for Lola. I think Lola, at least in the beginning, is a character with agency. She subverts expectations and she reacts in a way that's true to how we know her. She has glimpses of softness and has this very tangible fear of 
turning into her mother one day, a reasonable conclusion given the way that she talked about her mother previously. Her addictions and depression echoes her own struggles as a teen, so the constant worry of never being anything more than her mother's daughter is a relatable weight to see her carry on her shoulders. And in all of her rebellion, she still has the biggest heart, and that's kind of the problem with big hearts, is that not all of it completely hardens as much as we try or would like it to. Unfortunately, Lola doesn't necessarily escape the tropes of that character. By the end, her entire persona seemed to be shaped from the lyrics of Cherry Bomb by the Runaways. She's rebellious and she doesn't go by the rules and leaves a trail of fire in her wake. It's very that character. Also, this is such a non-point, but I love this scene. I just wish Tiffany would have ripped off her neck brace as she walked away. That probably would have made it 10 out of 10 for me. And this also brings me to the strength of this show. It's not Lola herself. It's Lola and her relationship with others. Others, starting with Elliot. When this first started happening, I thought it was kind of odd, but then it started speaking to me in that I enjoy the theme of people managing to find each other because of their invisible wounds. I also took it to mean that Elliot was a reflection of her addiction, but the kind where she could manage it and where it's not an overdrive. Kind of similar to how we start to befriend our depression instead of killing it because the latter is impossible and a lot of times only makes things worse. This idea was further solidified when Elliot asked her to be in his short film. Not even as like an extra, but as Lucas's supposed role in the entire film. You know, one of the leads. Even when he barely knew her. They were like six episodes in and already instant best friends, as if they'd known each other for life. It's their relationship that kind of made me see how each of their characters held a mirror up to Lola in that when she decided to take a part of herself down, she took one of them, you know, one of her sides with her. Also in mentioning Elliot, Maya, and Daphne, flawed characters around her that are all just trying their best to get by, there was a strong sense here almost of the best way to kick an addiction is to be in a relationship, which if left without context or like further explanation, could be pretty damaging. In one of these scenes, Elliot just outright says that he gets better every day because he has Luca by his side, almost implying that romantic relationships are the only worthy reason for getting better. And for an addict, that's what professionals in the medical industry might call shitty advice. But I think my argument here would be that Elliot isn't the only friendship that Lola has. In fact, Lola has her own family. She has Urbex and Maya. She had other reasons to get better so it could be interpreted as the road to recovery is unique from person to person and any reason that you have is valid whether it be a lover a friend yourself etc but the destination is the same also like a huge side note here as much as i love that elliot got to do his movie and these scenes were nothing short of endearing I cannot wrap my head around the fact that he decided to cast Lola for that scene. He didn't even have to cast Luca, honestly. It was just that that movie in season three, when it was first introduced, was heavily reliant on the fact that Elliot was pansexual. I mean, sure, you know, it could be argued that then that role would be open to anyone because it shouldn't matter the gender. However, I don't see the significance to casting Lola and to cast her this late in the show. It just feels like the movie became an afterthought as opposed to something that Elliot had been working on and the actual movie was so like I mean also because like Elliot presented Lola with a 50 page script it looked like and then the actual movie had like maybe two lines of dialogue unless the entire script was just like a description of her running around this deteriorating building which looked highly unsafe like it was a health hazard just to be within 10 meters of it. How how much is 10 meters? I'm not good. I don't know. And then maybe the rest of the script is just like direction on the kissing scene. Because that's all. Those are the only two scenes we saw. And honestly, I would believe that. A 50 page script purely about a kissing scene. I mean, it was written for Luca. So, <laughs> Ayo. Um... The parts about Lola's personality that I highly enjoyed 
all kind of had to do with Maya with a couple of exceptions, um, which again, we will get to that. When you have like girl on girl relationships as a lead romantic couple in your story, there are so many things working against you, especially when you're dealing with a character that's supposed to be promiscuous and reckless. There are certain expectations there that could fall into the whole category of like, is this just being told under the male gaze all the time? You know what I mean? Like you can over-sexualize this type of storyline. And I guess that's what I can commend Scum France for is the fact that Lola, at least to me, never seemed like she was being over-sexualized. I loved how her morning afters, like in the beginning, when she would meet all these different men and go home with all these different men, were always so bleary and kind of detached and blue. And the only love scene that we see in the entire show is between her and Maya. What made that love scene so impactful and layered is apart from the actual scene being gorgeous, is that it was an actual representation of Lola's sexuality. With all those other men that have come before Maya, <laughs> it was never about sex with them. They were all just conquests, and that's why they remained sort of non-factors, just sort of like faceless, warm bodies in the entire affair. Whereas with Maya, it was more warm and homey and comfortable because it was about sex and so much more beyond that. It was intimacy, it was vulnerability. It was also her just being able to surrender herself to that moment. And obviously when you're seeing someone that has gone through traumatic experiences, being put in that situation and opening up and warming up to it, there's something really beautiful there, and I cried a lot, and also Maya and Lola are just friends. I'm sorry. <laughs> they're obviously, they're, they're just really good friends. Um, Maya also kind of brought out Lola's sense of agency, like her ability to fight for who she loved and allow her to believe, even just for a second, that she deserves better. I don't believe Maya to be the sole reason for Lola wanting to get better. But I do see her as a huge proponent in Lola's motivations. It could also be just like a combination of Maya looking like a brighter future because she managed to turn her grief into something that doesn't stunt her development or who she is as a, as a person. It could also be because Lola feels a sense of shame in not being able to function the way Maya does when they've had kind of like similar-ish losses. And while I appreciate that they aren't the main plot in this entire story and merely meant to support Lola's recovery, the cracks in their plot unfortunately weigh the season down. Like one thing I have to mention is that their chemistry just wasn't it. It just wasn't it. Um, especially compared to its predecessors. And that isn't a slight against their performances because each of these actresses were phenomenal in their own right. This also kind of made for some very unconvincing and kind of mechanical scenes. Like the breakup scene was just kind of stiff all around. And in a lesbian season, there's no room for stiff. And it also kind of felt like forced conflict. This is something that I've noticed Gum France has a tendency to do, which is to just pile on the drama to the point where reconciliation doesn't hit as hard and at times can even feel unrealistic because you have about eight episodes of tearing something down and only a couple more to kind of super glue everything back together. And while I've seen other seasons kind of do the same thing and it turned out fine, I think it's because there weren't this many conflicts to deal with. So the resolution for the last remaining episodes kind of felt fitting. With Scum France, a lot of the conflicts were so heavy and innumerable that to wrap it all up with a happy ending in just a couple of episodes, or even less, kind of feels rushed. So instead of concentrating on the happy ending, you're more kind of stuck on the feeling of, so is that it? By far, the most interesting and complex relationship in this entire season is Lola and her sister Daphne. Sisterly Bond is the entire heart of the show, and they started on different points of the map, and the way they kind of came together over death and family and love was so beautiful to watch. It was their scenes in the series that got me really emotional because Gum France pulled off the complexities of not just female friendships, but sisterly bonds for the most part at least because 
like, yeah, I mean, admittedly, there were aspects of their relationship that seemed to be oversimplified. Like, for example, the build up to Benny Taxi. <laughs> what the fuck? Like, since the beginning of the season, Lola had been in contact with this IG user called Benny Taxi. And there was a lot of buzz created throughout the show as to who this person is. Now, I'm going to be honest, I watched this series in like, one sitting and i didn't look into the social media side of the show and i didn't pay much attention to benny taxi like i actually assumed that this was one of those randos that she slept with and just kept in contact with for no good reason it was when daphne admitted that it was her all along that it occurred to me that this could have been a mystery character that the show kind of played on and built up to and so I tried to look it up, and yeah, I was right. Like, it was one of those characters. I don't know, bro. Like, I just don't understand why. Like, I, I get that. Okay, if I were to try to reason with it, I get that if not for Daphne kind of going undercover and expertly tracking her sister down and fooling her into thinking that she was the safe space that Lola always needed, that maybe Daphne would not have been able to find her in the end. You know, like in the... in episode nine i think yeah episode nine because the photo of the place that lola went to was only sent to benny taxi and that's how elliot was kind of clued in on where lola could have been when she went missing and on the other hand it's daphne kind of coming forward to say that she's cared all along and still tried to understand lola even when she was hospitalized that the communication never stopped because she was benny and they were talking all along. And while it isn't a perfect solution, you know, Daphne acted out of love and desperation to reconnect with her sister. And I mean, things worked out, right? It's supposed to be like this full circle moment. Because if not for that, Lola might have gone through with whatever she was going to do in that abandoned building. Which, by the way, like people need to heighten security in these places more. Just, I don't know, light suggestion. How much are moats nowadays with the alligators? You can just look that up. I would have preferred that either there was no Benny Taxi at all or that it was really just some random person. And it doesn't even have to be like a random that she slept with, just a random person in general. Maybe they followed her secret Instagram out of nowhere and then they just started talking. Because I think that would have been a great commentary on how sometimes opening up to people online anonymously can be so much easier than talking to people that we know and surely that's a sentiment that some of us can relate to also because for the most of the season benny's role was pretty insignificant if you think about it on the topic of getting inside lola's head i think her instagram was more than enough and you know she says how she feels out loud anyway so it's not like we have to wonder for too long and on the topic of benny being daphne's alias i mean they were already finding ways to relate to one another without benny's help their communication wasn't perfect but their efforts were not in vain and the times that daphne and lola were good it wasn't because of benny if anything i would argue that benny was unnecessary noise in daphne and lola's reconciliation because lola would talk shit about daphne to benny and it could have also possibly put a strain in their relationship and set them a couple of steps back because Daphne was taking in all of Lola's anger without the ability to defend herself and, you know, was seeing herself be demonized in Lola's eyes with her hands tied behind her back. I can sort of take a step back and see what was trying to be accomplished here. That at least it tells a story of one sister trying her hardest to relate to a family member but it's just a little too contrived for me, especially during the reveal at a time when Lola was most vulnerable, her head wasn't in the right place. So to add to that, the fact that the person she had been talking to for years was not the person that she thought they were. I don't know, something about the way Lola reacted and the way that it all kind of came together just did not, it didn't make sense, it didn't feel organic. I think a high point of this plotline is Lola and Daphne kind of being there for each other at a time when they needed each other the most. You know, the passing of their mother broke their family apart. And watching that was what really got to me because losing a parent or a loved one is a major fear for a lot of us so that's one reason and another is just because you know i have lost a parent and stories like this will always get an easy cry out of me but that aside what would always get me about these scenes is how daphne lola and her father 
were kind of barely making it day by day. Their father, who was supposed to be the pillar of their family, relied on his daughters, his teen daughters, a great amount. And it's, I don't know, it's strange seeing your parents in that state of despair because they're supposed to be the ones that you lean onto and not the other way around. And on top of that, there was also the difference in mourning between Daphne and Lola. Like, it's made clear that Daphne had a much better relationship with their mom compared to Lola. So their grieving process is very different. And while there's a lot of up and down to Lola and Daphne's relationship, they still end up being each other's source of strength during this time, even if that connection felt very fragile. Urbex was great. <laughs> that's, that's all I have to say. Max, a time. Beautiful. Joe, adorable. That's it. Joe and Elliot season one. Okay, moving on. I think that addiction is a very difficult topic to write about, to say the least. You know, time after time, stories about addiction has been lost in the sea of over-dramatization. And I think the nurse said it best, which by the way, hello, welcome back. Relapse is not the exception, it's the rule. And this leads me to another point, which I promise you is for Scum France. Like, this is in defense of Scum France. I do not think that this kind of format of storytelling can do themes like addiction all that well because the format of the show is supposed to go week by week. And that's why it feels like it's too much because you have Lola dealing with her internal struggles, Daphne's eating disorder, her mother's death, Finding her real father, where the fuck did that come from? All of this in a span of a little over two months. And why other shows or movies or reading materials can kind of succeed in humanizing addiction is because they have the gift of time. They're not restricted to a format the way that Scum is. And this is why, while I loved this season, like honestly, I this is my second favorite season, just next to season three, I recognize both its weak points and what it was trying to accomplish. And I think it could have done better if they were allowed to go into years of Lola's life as opposed to the amount of time that they're limited to because of how the show is structured. I would even go as far as saying that some of the more interesting facets of the story and of Lola's recovery weren't even in the show. Like the time when she was hospitalized. I would have loved to have seen that. And her wanting to go back this time and doing it differently. Like, I can see the attempt in trying to wrap it up nicely, in trying to show us how Lola has changed with the help of a good support system and how her perspective on life has evolved, that she went from no longer focusing on flaws and more so people in the beauty of the world. But that's not the end of her journey, and that won't always be the case. I see this season as a strong attempt with huge potential. I think it had undeniably strong characters and shining moments, and obviously the cinematography and the editing, but ultimately, it just felt unfinished. Also, rip to this woman in the grocery line. I don't know if I'm going to be seeing season 7. Uh, maybe if I get enough likes. <laughs> it might... The Come on, like, let me have this. Let me have this moment where you like this video and don't judge me. I worked hard on it, okay? So, yeah, maybe if I get enough likes, <laughs> I'll do season seven. We'll see. I mean, the trailer looked great. And I am a fan of Tiff, although I barely mentioned her in this review. Um, but, yeah, I broke a nail. And I'm about to go. But here are some wise words for you. Um, don't 